Hello and welcome to lecture 76 of my class from Data to Decisions. I'm Chris Mack, your instructor. This is the third part of a series of lectures, four lectures to be specific, on Bayesian regression. So we talked last time about how Bayesian computations are generally done. We can, in some special cases, generate analytical solutions for the posterior distribution, but only when we have these special conjugate priors and other uh, specific conditions applying. Generally, though, we solve Bayes' equation numerically. Uh, we can use Markov chain, Monte Carlo sampling, something called Gibbs sampling, and all kinds of details that I'm not, not even that familiar with about the numerics. Um, and the result is a set of points for the posterior distribution, uh, and then we summarize those data points. Let me give you an example. Here is an output. Uh, I generated this in R. In fact, we're going to use this specific example in the next lecture when I show you how to do Bayesian, a uh, very, very simple way of doing Bayesian regression in R. And uh, this is the kind of output that you can get. So every data point is one Monte Carlo simulation of uh, an input uh, point in the prior distribution compiled through with the with the likelihood function to give us a posterior distribution. Then we do this, in this case, uh, 10,000 times to give us these 10,000 points, which produce something like a posterior distribution that we can summarize. Now, notice I have two parameters, the intercept and the slope, and uh, this is a joint posterior distribution. They're not independent of each other, as almost always is the case. Uh, there is some covariance between the intercept and the slope of a straight line FET. Um, we then summarize this posterior distribution, uh, often by looking for uh, the map estimate of the mode, which would be the point of maximum probability in this uh, posterior distribution. Here are the marginal uh, distributions plotted as, a, as curves, um, but again, it's really these, this two-dimensional uh, set of contours that would lead to our estimate of some point in the middle, as well as some credible intervals, say 95% credible intervals uh, as a contour along uh, here that allows us to um, produce our estimates of, of the uncertainty in our parameters. All right. There are three problems, three basic uh, difficulties when doing Bayesian regression, in my opinion. Uh, first of all, regressions are computationally intensive. Now, with lots of good software and, and powerful computers like we mostly have today, this is often not a big issue. But still, with fairly complicated models with lots of uh, regressors, and uh, you know, fair amount of data. Uh, these computations can take a long time. Um, but the most difficult aspect, in my opinion, is figuring out the best prior distributions to use. Um, it's not always clear how changes in the prior distribution will affect the output, and therefore um, how important it is to specify properly these prior distributions. Uh, and it's sometimes hard to take our prior knowledge and turn it into these numerical assignments of probabilities. Uh, so sometimes what we do is we'll just try different priors to see what happens. How sensitive is my output that results to my choice of priors? If I have a lot of data, then I'm, I become less and less uh, dependent upon the prior assignments. If I have less data, then my priors start becoming more and more important. So sometimes we'll play around with different means and variances of the priors to see how it affects the results. But then I think there's also some interesting philosophical questions that you might answer, such as, uh, is it really appropriate to treat every regression parameter as a random variable? Remember, in the frequentist view, we treat parameters of our model as unknown constants. And in the Bayesian view, we treat these uh, parameters as probability distributions, random variables with a PDF. Um, when is one approach more 
appropriate than, than the other for the specific context of the problem working in. That's always something worthwhile keeping in mind. All right, what I'd like to do next, and my last thing I'm going to talk about in terms of Bayesian regression, is how frequentist views and Bayesian views can inform each other in certain circumstances. Here's a circumstance that I have come across a lot, and it's always kind of bothered me until I learned this Bayesian way of thinking about the world. Um, often, we have a model that we're fitting to data, and we have some unknown parameters that we're trying to find the best fit. Occasionally, there'll be a parameter in the model which is not really uh, one of the parameters we want to fit. It's, in fact, a constant, a, a, a true at least we think of it as a true constant, such as maybe it's the um, uh, the viscosity of a liquid. Uh, and our model is about something else, but it happens to have this parameter. And we don't know the value of that perf with perfect accuracy. Right? We, say we have some uh, tables of values of, of, of viscosities of liquids that we can look up in some reference handbook. Uh, or maybe we went off and measured it ourselves in some separate experiment. But we know a value, but not with perfect precision. We know it has some uncertainty in the measured value of this, say, viscosity of the liquid. So what do we do? We really have two choices in the frequentist worldview. One is we can say that our constant is, in fact, a parameter of the model. Uh, we let it float. Fit. Uh, uh, include in our fitting, and we ignore the fact we have this textbook uh, uh, or table value that somebody else measured, or ignore the fact that I went and measured it last week and got a certain number. The alternative is to say that that number is, in fact, exactly accurate. We fix the constant to our best estimate of that parameter, and then we don't allow it to vary in the model. It becomes a fixed number. But that ignores uncertainty in the value. So what can we do? Well, we'd like to have some Bayesian approach. That is, we have an estimate, a prior understanding of what this parameter is, um, but we know there's some uncertainty to it. So can we add this um, Bayesian idea of a prior distribution to our frequentist regression? Here's how I like to look at it. We take minus the log of Bayes' equation, all right? So do that if you recall what Bayes' equation is. It's the, the likelihood multiplied by the prior and divided by uh, this normalizing constant, and that equals the posterior. So if we take minus the log of everything, we get, we get this equation. Now, this is called the log likelihood. And, of course, this value is a constant, which we're going to end up ignoring because if we're looking for the maximum of the... A posterior distribution, this constant doesn't make any difference. All right, so we look at the maximum of this posterior, log posterior, in other words, the mode, and that's our point estimate of the parameters. Now, let's suppose that our log likelihood is following a uh, normal IID uh, um, independent and identically distributed um, Ys. So our log likelihood produces our typical chi-square value of the residual square divided by uh, the uncertainty in the residuals. And we sum all those up. But now we have this extra term, minus log of our prior distribution, our priors. So our hybrid interpretation will go something like this. Remember, we've got some constant in our, in our model that we have measured value for from a prior experiment, um, and, and we want to somehow deal with the uncertainty in that constant parameter rather than just let it be a floating parameter um, or ignore our prior measurement. So our, our prior measurement will be, say, uh, g-bar. Uh, so we've done our measurement. We've got an estimate and an estimate of its error, standard deviation of g. Um, That'll be the g I'll just call the variable of this constant. Now, minus log of the prior distribution, if I assumed it's a normal distribution with a certain mean and, and standard error, 
uh, looks something like this. Um, so g hat will be the estimate of the parameter that I'll use in the model. g bar is my prior measurement, and s sub g is my uncertainty in that prior measurement. So including this uh, log prior into our uh, sum that we're trying to maximize is the same thing as adding a penalty to the chi-square by thinking about this prior estimate of g as a measurement. So the sum that we're trying now to minimize is our, our standard chi-square, the sum of all the data points minus the model divided by uh, the, the standard deviation model, that quantity squared all summed up. This is like it's an added data point, an added measurement. Uh, we've got our measured value, g bar. We have our modeled value, g hat. And we divide by the uncertainty in that measured value, quantity squared. It's like we're adding another measurement. And we try to minimize this. And now we let both the parameters by hat and this extra parameter, g hat, all float uh, in, in this way. Now we can do that with one specific constant, um, something we think of no, uh, typically as some uh, me separately measurable parameter. Um, but we can also think of that in terms of every constant, every parameter in the model. Suppose that we did this with every model parameter, and we assumed every model parameter had a normal distribution. Uh, that's the same thing as adding uh, for k equals 0 to p minus 1, that is all the parameters, p parameters, uh, the model best fit value of the kth parameter minus our prior estimate of the best fit parameter divided by our estimate of the uncertainty in that parameter. Uh, so we're adding this, this penalty whenever our parameters start deviating from our prior understanding of what those parameters should have been. Does this look familiar to you at all? Well, my title might give it away. This looks a lot like a ridge regression. If uh, the, the BK of the priors were all zero, that is, we assumed that every parameter had, um, uh, to the best of our knowledge, no impact on the output, all of our prior assumed parameters were zero, then in this hybrid interpretation uh, could be is exactly identical to ridge regression. So one way to think of this is this is kind of a, a, a justification for ridge regression besides just the uh, let's stabilize our regression when we have multicollinearity, which is what we use ridge regression for. for. Here we're saying uh, this is, in fact, a way of bringing in Bayesian ideas into our uh, normal least squares regression for the case uh, of, of prior assumptions of zero value for all of the parameters. But we can extend ridge regression by uh, allowing our prior uh, estimates of the parameters to be something other than zero as well. To me, this is very satisfying. This is a, a way of kind of merging the way you think about Bayesian regression and the way we have thought about ordinary least squares regression past. And uh, um, this hybrid approach both has some numerical value to it, but also some theoretical or philosophical or, or value in our understanding of how regression works. So this is one way I like to think about uh, emerging of Bayesian and frequentist ideas. All right, let's summarize Bayes regression and then summarize this lecture. Um, how do we do a Bayes regression in general? A Bayesian regression, we pick a prior distribution. Uh, we might pick a, a Gaussian or we might have some other reason to pick a different distribution. We generally pick distributions for all of the parameters but also for uh, the uncertainty, the, the random error in the experiment as well. We calculate the likelihood function in the usual way. 
And then we calculate the posterior distribution as the product of those two, uh, typically by using uh, a Monte Carlo, a Markov chain Monte Carlo kind of sampling. Then we summarize the posterior distribution estimate on that map estimate. Uh, and that is our equivalent to a best fit parameter with its confidence intervals around it. All right, what have we learned in lecture 76? As always, you should be able to quickly and easily answer these questions. If not, please go back and review the material. What are the major difficulties in Bayesian regression? I listed three of them. Explain how frequentist and Bayesian regression concepts merge in this hybrid form that I described. And finally, explain how this hybrid form relates to ridge regression and how, in fact, it becomes ridge regression under a special case. Well, that's our third lecture on Bayesian regression. There is so much more to learn about Bayesian regression than I will have time to go into. But in our next and final lecture in this series on Bayesian regression, we'll actually use R to perform some regressions. Till then.